Thank you, Marek. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so it's working, okay, good. So first of all, I would like to thank the university uh, and thank Marek and thank this beautiful country. It's been a glorious day and I had the privilege of walking up Mount Eden this morning. Um, it, it is such a beautiful place, so it's a great pleasure to be here. So when I travel, I've asked a Dharawal friend of mine to give me a welcome that actually works to acknowledge the country where my research is undertaken and to welcome you to that country because that country is where I work and live. So I'm going to read it first in language, uh, Dharawal language, and then I'll read the translation in English. So it goes, Daji Balang Onia, Yuali Berong, Nama Jol Gurang, Darami, Ngawai Budang, Bidiga Dugang, Nang, Nini, Bulimang Andira, Nini, Dingan, Turawan Bata, Nini, Kadulang, Gombi, Mewuna, Nini, Ngongawa, Nini, Nara, Damba, Gurang Gurang, Jijira, Onginga. So that says, we acknowledge the guardians of the spirit of this land. We give our respect to the elders, past and present. May you always see the beauty of the earth. May you always taste the sweetest fruit. May you always feel the warmth of the flame. May you always smell the perfume of flowers. May you always hear the laughter of children. We thank you. So in a recent study of Aboriginal parent engagement in children's learning funded by the federal government, all Aboriginal parents across urban, rural and remote sites told me that land, language, culture and identity are the most important elements in their children's learning. They identified learning as lifelong, beginning even before birth and said, that most learning happens outside of formal education, in the home, in community, and on country. Learning for them is about deep time as well as the present, because it includes learning from ancestral stories of the deep past, as well as stories from the present and the future. This can be understood as an expanded and expansive view of learning. In order to explore what this means for early years learning, I draw on the early childhood stories of Aboriginal artists and collaborators from a long-term project about water in the Murray-Darling Basin, Australia's largest and most endangered water catchment. For all of them, their early childhoods were shaped within the violence of colonisation, and yet they overcame these forces to produce extraordinary knowledges creative practices and transformative pedagogies. I've been particularly interested in thinking about this in relation to the, the recent exposure on uh, Australian media of children in detention uh, in Dondale. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's been the most horrendous experience um, for viewers, particularly watching this. So colonial practices continue to happen in Australia. But I guess one of the things is that for Aboriginal people to be always seen in terms of deficit and trauma is a really serious problem. And it's really serious in terms of keeping them stuck in that trauma in a sense. So this um, presentation is an opportunity for me to think through what it might look like for people who have actually overcome trauma in their lives and how have they done that and to, to celebrate and understand resilience really and to think about what the implications are for us as educators. So the first of the artist and cultural knowledge holders, Yuali I researcher Chrissy Joy Marshall, designed the methodology of thinking through country for our project about alternative stories and practices of water. Chrissy Joy came to me as a doctoral student to research the process of developing a conflict resolution package with a number of communities in New South Wales. 
She told me that she grew up by the Narran Lake with her Noongaburra grandfather and uncles and her Erinjinburi grandmother. 500 kilometers west of the office where we sat and talked, I visited the Narran Lake in all of its seasons, becoming intimately attached through Chrissy Joy's memories. She said, I don't remember a time without the lake. There were times when it dried back, but they were quite rare. It was always full and in season there'd be thousands and thousands of birds. You'd wake up in the morning to birds getting a fright, taking off and making a terrible clatter. Then going to sleep of a night time listening to all the birds, that lulled chatter that you hear of an evening. In stories of her Aboriginal knowledge, Chrissy Joy called herself by her Aboriginal name, <coughs> Imi Bergara Milburn, and the Narran Lake by its Uwalio name, Terawa, which means home of the black swan. The Narran Lake was everything to Chrissy Joy. It was the life source of her ongoing existence. After struggling with academic thought and language, we worked out that in order to make any knowledge claims at all, at all Chrissy Joy had to think through country, the specific country of the Narran Lake. And the methodology that informed all of our work together was born. At the same time, she told me the story of her life and how it came to be intertwined with the Narran Lake. Her grandmother had been taken captive as a young woman in her Erinjinburi country in the Gulf of Carpentaria on the far north coast of Australia. All of her people were massacred at the time, but she was allowed to live because she was young and beautiful. She was led the thousands of kilometres down through the Channel Country tied by a rope to men on horses. They travelled like this until they reached Dirranbandi, near the country of the Narran Lake, where the young woman fell ill with influenza. She was abandoned in the bush, left for dead. The Noongamurra mob from the Narran Lake found the seriously ill young woman and one of the men, having just lost his wife, believed that this was a spirit woman sent to replace her. He nursed her back to health in their camp by the Narran Lake. And it was there by the lake that Imi Bogara Melbourne's mother, Karawana, was born. The child who was born to the Erinjinburi grandmother and the Noongamurra grandfather grew to adulthood and she became pregnant to the white property owner. Fearing that the baby would be taken away because of the color of its skin, the grandmother took the pregnant daughter and traveled another very long journey, the 500 kilometers to Glen Innes, to, on the New England tablelands just north of where we sat. Chrissy Joy rarely spoke her mother's name. The story of her mother was told in just a few words. She died in two hours of me. She just bled to death. The grieving grandmother brought the baby back to live in the camp by the Narran Lake, where they started life all over again. Chrissy Joy developed the methodology using a combination of visual, oral, and written forms. In performing her methodology for her fellow students, she presented a painting and an accompanying oral story that structured and informed each cluster of meanings or chapters of her thesis. Through the painting she called Me, Myself and I, Chrissy Joy explained the concept of mulgari, which she says has been poorly translated as totem from American First Nations cosmology. She said, at the beginning all was mulgari, only creative power and intent. Through the intent and power of our creator, Mulgari reproduces into form to carve the beings and shapes of the world where the water meets the sky and earth sings the world to life. The pattern of life is Mulgari and Mulgari is traced in the law of the dreaming. Every tracing, rock, tree, plant, landform, water, fish, reptile, bird, animal and human is in the sacred relationship through Nidri, the dream time. The pattern, shape and form of Mulgri is life and all is a continuing tracing of the Mulgri. 
So I continue, and I still do, to dwell in the idea of Mulgrew from a place of unknowing and hope that through this dwelling I will gradually come to know. Her description of the painting began with the two black swans that you see in the right-hand corner. The first swan is for her mother and the second represents the collective of water people, the Nungamburra, her grandfather's people. The swans are Mulgri, signalling their collective meaning as mythical creatures of the dream time, as well as representing an individual's connection to a particular time and place. Chrissy Joy's mother is swan. Nungamburra people collectively are swan. Swan belongs to the time and place of the creation of the land and the people of Terawa, home of the black swan, the past, present and future. Those who carry that identity are both swan and place. Country, swan and person together are an ontological reality. When we adapted Thinking Through Country for the Water Project, Chrissy Joy did another painting of the Narran Lake which she described as finding and knowing place of self and others in country. Unlike her more typical muted ochre colours, this one is gaudy, pinks, greens, yellows, oranges and blues, the brightest and most energetic of all the paintings. Around the leafy green stems, fat, shiny white bodies of witchetty grubs are scattered across the country with the symbols of seated figures and their camps nearby. Chrissy Joy explains that this is a practical methodology, a learning that began in early childhood through which the practice of Mulgrew was embedded within their everyday lives. She said, as children, we spent much time following the life cycle of the grub, as we did with all other animals, birds, insects, and plant life. We would learn when they mated, how the mother prepared for her babies. We watched the young grubs grow, and we knew how to tell when they reached maturity. You can imagine the depth of knowledge gained from this kind of learning. It not only gave knowledge about the insect itself, but also about everything that is connected to it, the type of conditions most favoured, what learn we learned what happened when floods or droughts hit the area, what they needed to survive and what other animals fed on the grubs itself. In addition, we were shown how it all connected to us. So Chrissy Joy sustained injuries from a car accident that led to deteriorating brain function shortly after our project was funded. And while she remained as our leader and guide, other artists joined the team. And this is the team of us. So looking from the left to the right, it's Daphne, Sarah, that's Chrissy Joy in the middle, that's me, uh, Daphne and Badger down in the front and that's on a field trip to the Narran Lake um, when that first photo was taken with Chrissy Joy looking at the lake. So it was a lovely team and we had a fantastic time working together and what I'm going to do now is tell you a bit about each of the other artists and I'm reading from the book particularly because these stories have all been agreed to by the artist collaborators so I'm not taking any license telling their stories. They've seen them in print and I don't want to make a mistake by just talking them. So I'm going to read parts out of the book about the other artists. So Daphne was the first of three artists to join the project as it flowed with the waters through all of the Aboriginal countries of the Murray-Darling Basin. Daphne is a Gummeroy artist who grew up in Lightning Ridge, close to the Narran Lake, and had come to live in Armidale. She talked about what it meant to return to country as part of the project. She said, when you go home, you can feel that spiritual connection. When you go back to the place where there's proper bloodline connection there, because so many people were shifted outside of their areas, that when you do go where your bloodline from, you feel it really strong. At home, I'm so comfortable at home, and when I go to other places, I'm uncomfortable. 
People say to me, you shouldn't be frightened because you grew up in the bush, but our bush had no grass. She talked about her mother's memories of the traumatic removal of people from Angledool to Brewarrina. She said they carted people on the back of cattle trucks with outsides. She said people fell off and they were left behind. The truck wouldn't stop if anyone fell off, so people described that as like they were hanging on for their life, you know, on the back of this old cattle truck. Daphne said the idea of shifting people around was to break the spiritual connection to the land and then ceremony would stop. All that connection would stop. The damage was profound and Daphne grew up in abject poverty and hardship amid the abuse and dysfunction that comes when the social fabric of a people's life is destroyed. And yet her artwork offers extraordinary insights into the possibilities of creative transformations. So Daphne shared the story of the Binnum Binnum butterfly painting at the time of my husband's death. She made a cup of tea and we sat together at the dining table over the painting and she started to talk about my husband quietly and with great presence. It was as if she called him up to be there with, it, with us, Daphne, me, the Bin and Bin and painting, and him. She talked about her lack of education, her illiteracy, of how he helped her get into college, and then her position as a curator at the National Gallery. Then she turned to the painting and told its story. Now this is Bin and Binham. Do you know that Bin and Binham butterfly story? The Uralio people went down the river and met these wonderful people the caterpillar people, and they thought they were really wonderful people. They were so friendly. They did their fishing and everyone got on really well. Then when the Uralaroi people went back down the river a few weeks later, there were no caterpillar people there. They thought they had died. So when that happened, they turned around and had a big mourning ceremony. But the following spring, the Ualaroi people went back down the river again and there was this beautiful people there with beautiful colours. They were the Binnum Binnum people, the butterfly people. And what the Binnum Binnum people said to them, because the Ualaroi had done the big mourning ceremony, they said, no, we didn't die. Our spirit just transformed from that caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. So during the time of making the artworks for our project, Daphne painted 15 small acrylic paintings to make a child's storybook. The series of paintings that make up this book depict the changes in the passing on of knowledge in storytelling through the changing practices of home and country. The Yuri Yuri people appear in every painting as the shadow side of the story. They are the hidden meanings beneath the story that are only told through metaphor, image and illusion. In the light of the widespread experience of Aboriginal people of having their children taken away, the story that the Yuri Yuri people take them away for good, never see them again, resonates with the particular terror of that experience. But the cover image, however, reveals the paradox within this statement and its strong connection to images of water. The cover image sets the scene for the reading of the whole Yuri Yuri book. It shows three figures, Daphne's daughter Alpana, with a Yuri Yuri figure on each side, taking her away across the red earth country to the stars of the Milky Way. The red earth country in the foreground is dry country and beyond the red earth is the shimmer of the water of Corcoran Lake, the hidden story within the story. The water of Corcoran Lake mediates the figure's passage across the dry red country to the distant line of hills, into the sunset and the mythical star story of the dark night sky. The movement in this image is from day to night, light to dark, as it is in the book. Paradoxically, instead of a fearful taking away, 
It is the story of a metaphorical journey through time and place for Daphne's very precious only child, accompanied by the Yuri Yuri people, invisible creatures of the other world. In this way, Daphne pre presents the possibility of a creative transformation of a story of trauma and terror. So Badger Bates, a Bakanji artist from Wilcannia on the Darling River, sat with me to tell his story onto a map of a vast area of Western New South Wales. We marked two great arcs of knowledge and movement through country. The first, a continuous green line, maps Badger's travels with his grandmother and relatives to avoid being taken by the welfare. The second, a dotted red line, follows the line of water story knowledge, nurtured through these journeys with his grandmother and the old people, the line of the Ngarchis, the rainbow serpents, as they travel through the invisible underground waterways. Badger said, I was a target for welfare because I had fair skin, blonde hair. Lots of time when we was moving, I didn't like it when I was growing up, but it was good, you know, because I got to meet people from all over, out Burke, Wilcannia and Lake Cajelico. I was getting knowledge off my grandmother, plus these other old people. When I was real small, crawling, just walking, at a place I was reared up, Gran and them used to work on the dog fence. Up in that area, round Gundabooka and the Darling River, that's where the two Ngarchi started. They went down through Nokalesh, they travelled through Paru and Darling National Parks down to White Cliffs. They lay around on a hill at White Cliffs and they created all the land way over to the South Australian border. Then they came back at Yankanya and Brindawapa where they met the young ones that had come underground all the way from the Paru. So Badger said, it's sentimental. We're more or less in a triangle. What I done from Wilcannia up to Burke, across to Cobar, Lake Kijelico, back to Ivanhoe and back home. And ah, uh, the thing is the Darning River. That's it, that's me. That's what I love the most, the river and the Ngachi stories of the river. We call the river Faka, the Darling. That's how the Bakanji got their name, the river people. So home for Badger is Iron Pole Bend, Wilcannia, the place where Badger's granny caught their daily food, the place where he grew up in a tin hut on the banks of the Darling River, and where granny saw the visible form of the Ngachi as a water dog. His lino print of Iron Pole Bend tells so much more, mapping the relationships between country, water, life forms, representation and structures of knowledge. The print is structured around the two Ngarchis, deeply immersed in the radiating lines of force that represent the creation of the waters. From their mouths the flow of waters burst forth. Their bodies make the shape of the rivers and the invisible underground waterways in their travels. The flowing waters are alive with the river's creatures, cod, catfish, shrimp, yabby and mussels. At the top of a print, in a hybrid combination of a bird's eye view and a more typical western landscape, we can see Paitaka, the moon, and the emu in the Milky Way. The story of the moon in Lake Paitaka and the emu in the Milky Way connects earth country, water country and sky country, opening the intimate attachments of the everyday and home to the immensity of planetary rhythms of country, water, moon and stars. In this print, Lake, Lake Paitaka, the moon lake, is portrayed as littered with dead fish empty after a decade of drought and no water flows. At the time of carving this print, the mighty Darling River had died to a string of toxic puddles and water was running out in the town of Wilcannia. Badger said, so what I'm up to now with this artwork, I'm dreaming the Darling River's in flood, which it's not, but I'm dreaming it's in flood 
and it's flowing into the Murray. And that's why all the ripples in the Darling. And the Darling is just flowing again. It's actually just reached Benindi Lake after another drought. So finally, Trina Ham, a Yodda Yodda artist from the Murray River, was the last to join the project after I moved to Monash University. I got to know Trina through an art project to revive possum skin cloak making. Possum skin cloaks were made and worn by Aboriginal people in the colder parts of Australia until the turn of the 19th century. The cloaks were worn in ceremony, inscribed on the inner surface with the symbols of one's identity in country. Babies were wrapped in a cloak at birth and people were buried in their cloaks. As Trina said, you've got the beginning of life and the end of life. By the end of the 20th century, only two cloaks remained in Australia, both in the Museum of Victoria, and Trina was one of three Aboriginal women who were allowed to handle the cloaks and copy their designs. And from this, Trina developed the possum skin cloak making as an art form. This particular one tells the story of the creation of the Murray River and it's in the National Gallery and it was worn by Auntie Matilda House in the sorry ceremony in which Kevin Rudd apologised for the practice of the removal of Aboriginal children in the stolen generation. It was not until much later that Trina told me that she was taken from her birth mother. I was taken off her the day I was born and then my adopting mum and dad came down to pick me up. I've got two identities, two people, two families. I met my mother in Sydney in 1992, then came back to Wagga and told Uncle Don Atkinson, who got straight on the phone to family. I only saw her five times and she wasn't in a position to talk about a whole lot of culture because it was all about bonding and reconnecting. My two main connections to my Indigenous family were through the river and through art. I was drawing ever since I could hold a pencil and I was in Yarrawonga, 150 kilometres upstream from where my family was. So it's always been art and the river. Trina's and my lives became in inseparably entangled through her possum skin cloak making when I was terrified for the life of my newborn granddaughter. During this time, Trina told me the baby is going to be all right. She said the birds who came to visit the ledge outside my office were the ancestors looking after us. Take her for walks and talk to her about the birds. She told me about watching the Aurora Borealis as Luna was being born and when planning to think and when naming her to think of the morning sun. She is Eva, a new beginning. And she made me a possum skin cloak for the new baby girl. And I've got the possum skin cloak here because I thought you might want to have a look at it or a feel of it because one of the really nice things um, about having one that I own that's not in a national gallery mm -hmm. is that I can hand it around and people can touch and feel it. Um, and I guess the, the ability to touch it and feel it is, is really what cloaks are about. They're very material. Um, and, and that was made to wrap the baby in so that the baby would be well and the baby survived and is now eight years old. Um, so the fur on the outside is soft and warm, the inside an intensity of colour and symbol. At the top in the centre, an elongated oval shape with a thick outer rim, a pale red ochre womb space. Protected within are the symbols of the ancestor birds, the leaf growth of new life and a nurturing breast. The womb space opens to a passage lined with the leaves of the ancestors that lie along the white river of the creation cloak. Leaves from the sacred spirit trees, 
the mighty river red gums of the Murray River. The passage leans, leads to the bottom of the cloak where it merges into river patterns of moving waters, into the flow of water and life, around the womb space at the top and all down each side the white river curves and bends, surrounded by patches and patterns of all of the different countries around the river. In and out of the river winds, winds the rainbow serpent of creation. It is Trina's and my mother's stories intertwined in Eva Luna's baby cloak. And Trina said about the baby cloak, she said, imagine the river without a map, having it in your head. That's how people found their way if they got lost. The little ones would start with a small cloak and as they got older, they could come along with it on. Just throw it down and talk with the mob. This is my country. This is where I come from. You could wear it as a cloak and use it as a map together. So that's the end of the, the stories that I wanted to tell. So it, it's kind of, um, I wanted to take you on, on an experience rather than an academic lecture and so I've put together just a few ideas that I think um, we might want to say about what came out of the violences of colonisation for these people. So I think what, what they have done is develop the most extraordinary knowledges and I think these knowledges are contemporary. They're not any romantic knowledge of a, a traditional Aboriginal past, but, but they are very contemporary knowledges that work for them to live their daily lives and that we can learn from to live our daily lives. Um, they're alternate, alternative onto epistemology, so they're alternative ways of being and knowing the world through new creation stories and new accounts of colonial histories. I think they developed a lot of creative practices in this project, all different forms of representation through which to speak things that can't otherwise be spoken. There's lots and lots of stories that, that I haven't told that are expressed in a whole series of artworks, um, different forms of art that, that express all sorts of things that, that are unsayable. But communicable to an audience through that. And we had a whole lot of exhibitions in regional Australia where um, the artists invited people along and talked to them. Um, so that's what I think the transformative pedagogies that came out of the project was really in these series of <coughs> intercultural exhibitions. So they were exhibitions particularly for a wide general audience. They had no sense that these stories or their artworks were just for Aboriginal people. They were for a wide general audience and they really wanted to engage people in conversation. So they had all sorts of conversations with landholders and different white people with totally different views to them. And the artworks worked as a kind of mediator a thing between them and the people that both protected them but also gave other people insight into the ways that they were seeing and viewing the world. Uh, and there was a whole range of things like storytelling, walking in country that happened as a result of these exhibitions and changes that we could actually document. So I guess finally I just wanted to think and I might hand over to Jacobe here. Um, whether these accounts of the intercultural space of colonisation and, and the productive power of change um, can be a fundamental basis for early childhood or for any educational practice really is, is my question. C can that be a basis for educational practice? Uh, and in Australia, you know, if it can, the question is how to get that to happen. What, what would this mean? What would it mean if you decided that this was the basis of an educational practice? 
And then what might be the similarities and differences between Australian Aboriginal and New Zealand Maori experiences? So that's it.
That's a really interesting and good question. So, countries capitalised because um, at the time of settlement there were 500 different language groups in Australia and that's 500 different countries. So when we think of a country, um, we think of Australia as a country or New Zealand as a country, but for Aboriginal people, these are literally 500 small eco-social units with their own languages and language that actually derived from country, that lives in that country. So country is capitalised to indicate that it is a particular country, that when we walk in country, it is a particular place, a place that we know, a place whose stories we know, a place that we can sing, a place that we can sing to life and sing to well-being. And thinking through country was the, the idea that we chose to talk about different ways of thinking. So, so that if you thought through country, you would start with country rather than with abstract thought. So in the English language, we very much start with abstract thought. And abstract thought is the highest possible thing. But for Aboriginal people, the materiality of country, country in all of its connections, and us as only part of country, not as an important or more important part of country, is what's primary. Uh, and it's not even always expressible in language. It's expressible in terms of being. So, so language, the words that are attached to it, uh, are second order after the being in country. And I suppose walking in country is one way for outsiders to start to have that experience and start to learn what it means to be in country and start to learn what it means to think through country. I guess for me, I had the privilege of going to live in the desert with my husband when I was only 20. Um, I had two small children by then and I did ceremony with women in the desert and I learnt about that without having any language, without having any ability to understand particularly secret women's language. Um, I was painted, I danced, I sang because I had to because everyone who was of childbearing age knew how to do that. Um, so I kind of learnt that experience and I guess then through all of my academic life I've been interested in that as a primary experience and how uh, as non-Aboriginal people we might come to some kind of reconciliation with that, some kind of way of understanding what it means to live in this very ancient land of Australia uh, with the people who are its original people. So does that answer it? Thanks. So you had a question?
That was very, very early days though. And when we returned from the desert, I started teaching in TAFE and I was teaching Aboriginal adults returning to education. A lot of them had grown up on missions and, and were older women who had had no education at all. And I was really fortunate to have an open curriculum. It was just called communications. And so really the students had a ball and, and made up newsletters and wrote stories and all of that. And that was really my introduction to the complexity of contemporary non-remote life. Um, and I was wondering all the time then what country meant to these people. And so we did a lot of things of going out and walking in country and then I became part of a very significant revival movement in Australia. So a later project, I did a lot of language work uh, with people on the coast. And we now have children graduating in the school certificate and high school certificate in Gumbangi language, not through any work of mine, but just that I was involved in this kind of wonderful revival language revival and language revival is very very active at the moment in Australia so there's a lot of stages of all of that and different things that I've been involved in but I guess I'm in an incredibly lucky situation now where I've got basically what is regarded as family all over so I can travel anywhere and there'll be someone who knows someone I know and they will fit me in when you first go and live in the desert they gave me a skin name. So I was Noongarai, my husband was Jangara, my children were Nambajimba, Nambajimba. And they were, that related me into the community so that I had, everyone was then my family and I had various social obligations to them. But in a way, the same thing happens in contemporary urban life where, like for example, I just learned that one of the Aboriginal education officers that I've been working with in a recent project who comes from Briwarana, her niece lives in Armidale where I used to live. My son has gone back to live in Armidale and stays in this house when he's working at the university. And so this connection, kind of, you know, they say, yeah, your family. Um, so it's like that, it, it's the ways that traditional practices get translated into contemporary forms. And that was one of the things I wanted to emphasise about the work about parent engagement in children's learning. I was surprised that for urban Aboriginal parents and rural Aboriginal parents and remote Aboriginal parents, the theoretical framework is identical. There is no difference. There must be other questions, <laughs> comments. <laughs> we probably are. I guess my first answer to that question would be that's why early childhood is so crucial 
Um, so it's in early childhood that, that children form their sense of being in the world. And my new project, um, so, so my work equally focuses on sustainability, planetary sustainability. And my new project funded by the Australian Research Council, which has now grown into a collective of people all over the world, uh, is looking at the emergence of different forms of language in early years learning on the assumption that children who are growing up today will grow up into a world that, that we will never know um, and that we need to learn from them. So we're actually looking very closely, at the moment we're doing what we call deep hanging out uh, with kids, just looking very closely at the sorts of ways they're naming the world. So, so the project is called Naming the World. So I guess at the heart of that question, which is such a good question, for me is the relationship between language and representational practices, drawing and all of that. The ways that we know the world and how we can be in the world and thinking about how to do that differently. Because the fundamental difference between Aboriginal onto epistemologies, Aboriginal ways of being and knowing um, is profound in relation to, to naming, to, to how we talk about the world. And so I think if we go back to early childhood, I actually believe that we gradually teach out the sorts of things that human beings are capable of. And that if we didn't teach it out, um, we, would, we would be able to learn how to teach and learn in different kinds of ways. So I've, I've seen this happen um, with children who have lots of opportunities to do different things outside of school, who have a very different relationship to the world. Um, but at the moment I'm just kind of exploring how that works um, with very young children and in this first stage, as I said, just doing deep hanging out, making these tiny little videos uh, and analysing those in terms of movement, gesture, sound, vocalisation, words and so on from very young children up to age five uh, and just thinking about what that all means and if, if we did do that, then what that would mean for early childhood pedagogies. So working then with the educators and saying, okay, if we can see all this, what would this mean about the ways that you might set up your centre? Or what might this mean about your practice of relating to the children? So that's the only thing I can come up with. And of course, um, having more Aboriginal people in our schools is really critical. So one of the projects that I've just finished, I worked with Aboriginal education officers and in one school where we have a particularly active Aboriginal education officer who teaches Aboriginal culture, identity, history and so on. We have more children in that school who want to identify as Aboriginal <laughs> than anything else. So that's a complete reversal of what is normal. So normally white children and all Aboriginal children don't want to identify as Aboriginal. So just watching the different things that actually change the dynamic, I wish it could be much more different. I wish we could say to our education authorities we should have uh, a curriculum that's much more informed by the land in Australia and that that's where knowledge comes from and how curriculum might look totally differently, but that's not going to happen quickly. And whether it happens at all, <laughs> not in my lifetime. 